Wilbur, I'm from uh, New Jersey. Um, this is beautiful Point Pleasant Beach for those of you who think that New Jersey is all like oil refineries and, and turnpike. Um, it's a really a beautiful uh, state. Um, the talk that I wanted to give um, today, I'm really happy to have an opportunity to do this here. Um, uh, first of all, I, I've, I've done a lot of teaching in my, as part of my day job, and so I've always learned it's good to know what your audience is like. So how many here are relative beginners at Japanese tools? Jay, yeah, of course. All right. Um, uh, how many of you here are like, relatively experienced with, with, with them? No, some? Okay, good. Um, because the other title that I had for this uh, talk was A Beginner's Guide to Japanese Tools, um, which actually is the same thing as uh, where Japanese and Western hand tools intersect. Um, if, uh, and and you'll see, I think uh, you'll see why as I get through this. So um, the first thing is that I wanted to uh, acknowledge that I've learned a ton of stuff from a lot of people about Japanese tools over the years. And here's a list of them. Some of them you know, Jay Van Arsdale standing in the, in, in the back, Harrelson Stanley, I know as well walking around, um, Jim Blauvelt, so walking around uh, here. But some of them are people that are firmly entrenched in the Western woodworking tradition. Um, and, uh, and I actually want to give a special shout out to my friend Stephen Shepard, who unfortunately passed away over the, uh, 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 a little while ago. He's a... Uh, um, he, he's one of those historic rec uh, recreation guys out in Utah, and he knew everything there was to know about um, traditional Western uh, w woodworking techniques. And believe it or not, even though he once took a Japanese chisel because he wanted a laminated chisel and that was the only way that he could get one, but he was so entrenched in the Western technique that the first thing he did was completely flattened out the hollow in the back. <laughs> um, I, I actually learned a lot about Japanese tools from, from him. Um, I'm a hobbyist woodworker. Um, this is a Bible box that I made. It doesn't project very well, but it, it, it's made out of walnut. It's got um, a burl veneer on the front and some edge banding around the side. It's probably one of the nicer uh, things that, that I make. So this is, what, this is where I come from, from, from a woodworking perspective. And I belong to a woodworking club, um, and most of the guys in the, my woodworking club are like uh, my friend Chuck Bender over here. Now, uh, you may have heard of Chuck Bender. He does a lot of teaching. He's a fantastic woodworker. He's spent his life in the profession. Um, but this is what most people think about when they think about woodworkers, right? You think about a guy facial hair, um, a workbench, Western tools, machinery in, in, in the back. And what I, when I first got into Japanese woodworking, the first thing I, I was told was how different the Japanese woodworking world was from the Western woodworking world. And, and, and this is the uh, image that uh, people were projecting, you know, sitting on the ground uh, with all these tools that work in the opposite direction and, 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 and all, all of that. And, and I kind of understand where this comes from because there's this guy, his name is Barrett Dean, and he's famous for um, getting a lot of Japanese swords and armor and donating it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So if, you have a if you're visiting and have a chance to get over to New, um, to New York, um, at the Met they have a big section just full of uh, Jap Japanese um, uh, artifacts that uh, this guy brought in. And, and here's a picture of him kind of dressed up in a samurai uh, outfit. And like once you look at it, um, you know, on one hand, I'm sure he's, you know, appreciative of the culture, and the other, but on the other hand, it just looks weird, right? Um, it, it, and, and I think this, um, uh, this sort of, uh, you know, uh, clash of the cultures provides a disconnect that makes Japanese woodworking, ironically, a little bit less approachable for your typical um, uh, woodworker that you meet in your everyday uh, life. So. One of the re uh, reasons I wanted to put together this talk um, is to, uh, for the guys here that know a lot about Japanese uh, woodworking, um, to uh, hopefully make your outreach better. Because at least from my, from my experience, if I spend a lot of time talking about you know, Zen philosophy and Buddhism and how all that uh, uh, affects woodworking and how you know, people spend eight hours working on a plane so they can enter a planning contest, your typical woodworker is just going to turn their mind right off. Uh, and they're not going to listen anymore. So part of this is um, uh, my way of explaining how Japanese tools work to people who aren't interested in that sort of thing. And all they want to do is like bang out some cabinets uh, or some furniture for their, uh, for their home. Okay, so um, 
anyone who's interested in hand tools as it applies to woodworking has to understand the culture in which the, those hand tools were developed and how they were used. Because hand tools these days often are used not in the manner that they were traditionally used, and, and things get kind of wonky back then. So. In terms of Japanese tools, we can start with China. I'm Chinese, so that's why I'm going to do this. <laughs> but it's, it's not an understatement to say that China was the cultural and economic powerhouse of Asia throughout um, this period of history. So you have the Ming Dynasty over here. And, um, and then in Japan, uh, in, the, in the 1600s, they went to the Sakoku period, the period of isolation, where they really cut off um, uh, contact with the outside world, even areas in the, uh, immediate to Asia. They certainly no, oh, very little to almost no contact with the Western world, but uh, Japan really wasn't doing a whole lot of trade or engagement with uh, Korea, China, the, the other Asian uh, countries. So if we think about what's going on in the Western world at this pr point in time in terms of woodworking, this covers the Jacobian period, the William and Mary period, the Queen Anne period, the Federal and Sheraton period, Chippendale and Heppelwhite furniture, and Shaker furniture. And all this development was happening during the Sokoko isolation before Admiral Perry showed up in Japan with a bunch of warships and decided to open up the country again. So it's probably not an um, unreasonable uh, uh, um, uh, idea that woodworking tools in Japan might have evolved differently because it was sort of isolated. And in some ways, I think sometimes think about Japanese tools as like the platypus of woodworking tools. You know, they got stuck off on this island for a couple, few hundred years, and they evolved in their own way. Uh, in, in, in their in their own way. The other thing I wanted, uh, wanted to point out uh, historically is that during the time of period furniture making, which is what most Western woodworkers are into when they think about hand tools, um, that's between 1700 and 1820, uh, still Asia was the primary driver of, of world economies uh, uh, there. The dark maroon bar is uh, China's GDP. The salmon looking bar is India's GDP. Japan contributes some to the world economy. But you can see as a whole, Asia is really dominating uh, um, the world economy in terms of uh, economic output, and if you take, if you know anything about the obsession that the Western world had with Asian objects during uh, during the time, and there's a whole other talk you can have about how Ming Dynasty furniture influences Queen Anne and so on and so forth. Uh, that's the world that we were living in. So, um, so where did tools start? Tools start with having sharp pieces of steel that woodworkers need to carve wood and shape it so that they can build stuff. And this is actually the approach that I started off with when I started thinking about Japanese tools. Because at the time, this is about 12 years ago or so, um, I, I, I didn't have a whole lot of information that made sense to me. Um, oftentimes I would ask, um, you know, call up a store and say, why, uh, I, I want to buy a chisel, why should I buy this chisel? And the answer often was, well, the blacksmith is 80 years old and he spent all of his life making these chisels, so he's really good at it, and, he's, and his family isn't going to carry on the, uh, the tradition because his uh, kids don't want to do this, and so buy this chisel because he's going to die soon. Um, that's not a compelling argument for someone who doesn't, who, who's a beginner to, uh, to this. And yes, there's, a, there's value for someone who spent their life perfecting the art of blacksmithing, but you have to be able to explain it uh, uh, to people. So this is what I've learned about um, tool steels and how they work. And I have to thank my dad uh, you know, for this approach, because my dad is a physics professor, and he kind of raised me to believe that you know, taking a somewhat scientific approach to things is a, is a good way uh, to go. And so the way, and the other thing is, um, uh, probably growing up Asian America in the Midwest, I had to learn how to fit in um, and look for commonality with other, uh, other people. So I decided to think, uh, take this approach. Instead of focusing on how different Japanese tools were from the West Western tools. I started to look for similarities because my presumption was Japanese woodworkers had the same priorities that Western woodworkers uh, did. Again, sharp pieces of metal, shape wood, build stuff, and do it quickly and as fast as possible so you can make money. And that's where I started from. So if we take a look at how steel is made, Steel making has cropped up in various parts of the world, but the basic principle is the same. I'm just going to talk about what happened in Asia. So 
You have iron deposits, and in Japan, it's primarily iron-rich sand, not ore deposits like you have in England. And you have charcoal. And somewhere, in, in, as far as Asia goes, um, this, uh, this combination of using iron-rich sand and charcoal to make steel had been known since 200 BC, and it originated in, in, in China. And it's just like a little picture of a, a traditional method of making uh, steel, where they just pile a bunch of charcoal and iron-rich sand and just burn the, burn the thing for a long time. And eventually, you get this stuff. Stuff. Um, you know, th this is, uh, this is car uh, high carbon steel. And, and granted, it's not a very pure product because it, it, there's not a whole lot of control. Because remember, this is you know, a thousand years ago. Um, but they, the people there were smart enough to know that some of these chunks of steel, you could like smash flat and it would sort of flatten out like that. And you could bend it and shape it and maybe use it for decorative items and it wouldn't break very easily. And there are other, other pieces of steel that were very brittle um, and very hard and they could take an edge, but they might crack. Um, and even though they didn't understand what was going on at the time, you don't need a whole lot of brain power to understand that one piece of metal might work differently than another piece of metal. You can actually start sorting these things out. And that's what they did back, back in the day. Well, this is the scientific re uh, uh, rationale behind this. And it, uh, it's a phase diagram for how steel works. And, and you don't have to know anything about this diagram in order to understand how this works. But basically, this is what happens. This axis is how much carbon is in the steel. This is the temperature that you put the stuff in. So you put iron and carbon together, and you're down around here when you start. And then you throw it in a furnace and heat it up, and it goes up over here, and it changes uh, character at this point, and then you cool it down, and it drops back down over here, and that's how you make uh, steel. This is what happens on a molecular uh, level. Um, basically, just pay attention to this top cube over here. The black dots are iron, and if you have just pure iron, it tends to arrange itself in a cubic structure, but there's not a whole lot of stability to that structure. So picture like toothpicks and pieces of clay you make a cube out of. You can like start slanting the, the, the cube one way or another, and it'll twist back and forth, and you put it back straight. And that's why uh, you know, iron without a whole lot of carbon, you can shape it in a lot of different ways to do whatever you want, and it's not going to break on you. You can you go back and forth, back and forth, and, and uh, uh, it'll be fine. Where the carbon comes in, and the carbon is the red dots over here, carbon just happens to be the right size, where if you wedge it in the face of this cube, it's going to stick there. And guess what? You know, most people know that when you heat things, they expand, and then when they cool, they contract. Well, that's pro probably what happens when you're making uh, tools too. You have this iron cube, and it stretches out a little bit as you uh, heat it up, and then uh, carbon just pops itself in there, and then as you cool it down, it traps the carbon in place. And that's how you get uh, uh, carbon, uh, carbon steel. There are other ways that the iron and carbon can combine together to make steel, but this is ba the basic principle um, here. And, and the thing is, is that this is actually a solved technology going back to at least 1300 in, in, in Asia, because um, again, if, if you go to the Met, you can see this uh, dagger over here. And if you take, a, I tried to take as good a picture of this as I could, but if you take a look at the lamination line on this thing, it's perfect. It is absolutely perfect. And this dagger was made in 1300. So even though the blacksmiths at the time probably didn't know what was going on from a scientific or you know, molecular level, they sure knew how to work with the material to, uh, to uh, get the tools that they, uh, that they needed. So as I mentioned before, um, when you're making uh, iron, you have the transition from iron to steel, you have um, different properties that are, uh, that are involved here. And the two main ones that affect us as woodworkers are hardness and toughness. So hardness is when you have more carbon in the steel. Because what happens is that these little bits of um, uh, steel are called carbides. And the more carbides you have in a piece of uh, steel, the harder it'll be. Um, and then the properties of the carbides that will affect how the uh, uh, steel, uh, steel behaves as, as well. So hardness is good because um, in general it'll allow you to uh, make an edge on it and it'll allow the edge to stay there as you use the tool. But it's also not good in the sense that hard steels tend to be brittle and they can break if you just sort of smack them uh, the wrong way. Toughness is the property of steel where you can bend it and, it'll, and it won't break. And, and uh, steels with lower amounts of carbon tend to have this property. Um, and that's why um, uh, uh, tool, uh, tools be, um, often had this laminated structure to them because you have the, the hard steel at the cutting edge. 
um, where, uh, where you need the uh, durability of the edge. But you don't want to make the whole tool out of that sort of steel because it might crack if you drop it or something. So you laminate a softer layer of steel with less carbon on top of it, and that provides the structural stability so that I can take my chisel and smack it like this, and I'm pretty sure it's not going to crack. Right? Um, so carbon content does play into um, the hardness versus toughness issue. The other thing that plays into this is alloying agents. So a, a while back, they figured out that if you took small bits of certain minerals and threw that in the mix, that would affect the structure of the carbide that uh, could affect the hardness and the toughness as well. And this is, um, uh, when we talk about Japanese, tool, Japanese tools, oftentimes we talk about the type of steel that's used for the hard layer, you know, white steel, number two, blue steel, number one, super blue steel, a whole lot of things. And this is kind of how you, you make it. You start off with industrial level um, uh, carbon tool steel, and you remove the impurities and get yellow steel number two. And then you remove more impurities and get white steel number two. If you, then you add carbon, you get white steel number one. If you add alloying agents, primarily tungsten and chromium, you change white steel into blue steel. And then if you add more carbon and more alloy agents, then you get blue steel number one. So the point is, is that the more carbon you have, the harder the steel is going to be. Um, and the more alloying agents you have, the more um, uh, abrasion resistant the tool, is, uh, the, the tool is going to be. And that's basically the bottom line as to um, how all the various tools, uh, steels uh, fit into the tools. So the, the common question if you're getting started is, oh, well, I, if I want to get a chisel, uh, should I get a white steel chisel or a blue steel chisel? And really the answer is, you know, um, the, the answer that I usually give is um, talk to the people who, t who um, uh, who sell Japanese tools because they know uh, wh which tools are good for you know however much money you might want to pay because everybody does have a budget. Um, and if you um, find a tool uh, dealer that you like and they recommend a blacksmith, buy the tool from that blacksmith. Because what you're really buying is not a chisel or, 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 or a plane. What you're buying is a relationship with a tool maker, which is far more valuable over the long run. It's like building up a relationship with a lumber supplier or you know, uh, your local farmer if you're, if you're into one of those food co-op uh, co things. Um, because the way that I look at it is asking if I should have a chisel made out of blue steel or white steel, it's sort of like asking, um, you know, should I make a bookcase out of walnut or should I make it out of cherry? And the answer is that uh, Frank Klaus will make a better, way better bookcase than I ever, uh, ever will. Um, this is a little table that I uh, put together one time to uh, sort of uh, uh, sort out for me the differences in the, in the various minerals. And these two first columns are O1 tool steel and A2 tool steel, which are pretty commonly used in Western, um, uh, uh, Western uh, uh, tools. And the rest are the Japanese um, uh, tools. And basically, it, doesn't, it may not look like the amount of extra carbon is a whole lot because we're talking about 0.95% versus 1.05%. But if you actually take a look at the um, uh, percent Percentage-wise, this is actually 10 to 14, 40% more carbon in Japanese tool, uh, tool steels than you can find in the Western uh, tool steels. And this, I do think, is, is, a, um, uh, is a bit of an, an advantage. And so I've been talking about carbides and stuff, but this is basically the model that I think of when I think of a, a, a tool. Uh, you have these carbides, the blueberries, and they're embedded in a matrix, which is like the muffin. Um, so, uh, so that's that's what a uh, what the tool steel uh, looks like on a microscopic level. And if you go to material guides for these steels, you'll see that they, uh, if you have a piece of A2 steel, that it uh, you can expect the carbides to be a certain size. In this case, it's 13 microns. O1 tool steel has uh, slightly smaller um, uh, uh, carbides, about 10 microns. And I've actually drawn it to scale in this picture here, uh, so you can see what um, what happens. So if you, if you think about how people talk about the difference between A2 and O1 tool steel, uh, this is what people tend to say. A2 steel tends to hold an edge for a longer period of time. It's a bit harder to sharpen. And it doesn't really work well if the angle on your tool is too, is too small. Well, why would that be? Well, I think this is the explanation here, because if the carbide is going to be bigger than a one steel, which is easier to sharpen, and you can sharpen to a finer, a finer edge, um, the amount of um, angle that you can get on that is dependent on the size of that, uh, of that carbide when you get right down to the cutting, uh, cutting edge. And so, and so, again, this is a way of taking the science and translating it into real physical properties that everybody can, uh, can understand. So 
the lamination process, Jim uh, Blava didn't actually gave a great demonstration about this um, y yesterday. I have a little video, just in case you're not familiar with this process. Sorry. And basically, what this is is a very hard piece of steel that uh, the blacksmith is putting in uh, uh, some flux. And he's going to put it on a softer piece of steel there. Okay. It's taking time to make sure it uh, gets in the right position. And then he heats the sucker up. Um, and this is where, uh, and, and he's surrounding the, the tool with charcoal, and the re reason you want to surround the tool with charcoal is that um, the heating process actually causes some of the carbon to escape from the tool, and so this is a way of making sure it's surrounded. And then he pounds the crap out of it. <laughs> um, and, and this pounding part does a lot of uh, things. It, it basically forge welds the two pieces of steel together, so that's good because not, then your plane isn't or, um, uh, or chisel isn't going to de delaminate. But it also does something to the carbides, and what it does to the carbides is it actually physically breaks them down as you're pounding away on them. Because remember, the, tools, uh, the steel is pretty hot at this point, and the carbides are not completely formed yet, and you can still do stuff uh, with them to change their, uh, their, their properties. So that's what happens. So what happens when the carbides break down? Well, they become finer and finer, and they actually get more evenly distributed throughout the tool. And so instead of a blueberry muffin, you have a lemon poppy seed muffin. And this is, I think, what's happening with uh, Japanese tools and what gives them the properties that they do. So if we go back to my diagram over here, and here, this is the part where I've had to make a little bit of a stretch, but I don't think I'm too far off on this. Um, I don't have good information on what the typical carbide size is in a Japanese tool. Um, that information, I've looked hard for that information. If anyone knows that information, please tell me. Um, or if you have uh, access to a metallurgist who has an electron microscope, put me in contact with them. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I have found information on what happens with Damascus swords, um, which were for, made in the Middle East uh, somewhere, uh, somewhere around the year 1000 or so. And they have examined those swords. And the, and the construction technique is very similar. Hard piece of steel, laminated, forged, welded, you know, really sharp. They have fantastic uh, cutting properties. And, what, and uh, a paper that I found showed that the carbides in a Damascus sword is about three microns. So if we put that up with this diagram here, that's what that looks like. And, I, and I've actually drawn this to scale. So if you think about the properties people talk about Japanese uh, uh, tools, number one, they hold an edge for a really long time. Why? Because they have more carbides than maybe a typical Western, uh, Western tool. Number two, they're easy to sharpen. Why? Because when you sharpen, all you have to do is like, you know, shear off these little, uh, these smaller carbides, uh, as opposed to trying to pop out one of these things, which is much bigger. And you have two choices. You can either pop it out or you can slice it in half with your sharpening media, uh, neither one of which is a, is a great thing in terms of its edge. And, um, and the edges seem to be very durable because you're now supporting the cutting edge much further out to the edge than you can with uh, the Western tool steels. Now, there's actually one more method of making uh, tool stills in, in the West, and that's using CPM technology, so something pow powdered metal. Um, and basically what you do here is you take all those ingredients that go into steel and you powderize them and you mix them up and you put them in granules and then you stick them in an inject molder and then you heat them up in, uh, and, 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 uh, so, that, so it all fuses together and then you have your final product and then you can grind it and shape it to what, the way that you want. Um, and the most famous uh, version of this uh, is um, Lee Valley's Veritas uh, PMV11 uh, uh, chisels and plane blades that they're making with this technology. Um, and the interesting thing here is that CPM technology also seems to have um, resulting carbides that are around three microns, maybe a little bit bigger than that. Um, and when I read reviews of these um, uh, chisels uh, from people who have used Japanese chisels, they say that they're probably the most like Japanese chisels uh, out of all the vari vari various uh, Western um, uh, tools that are out there. Although Japanese chisels seem to be better, so there you go. Um, all right. So, so lamination, like I said, is, is a very important part of Japanese tools because you have the hard steel and the soft layer steel, and you, you can um, uh, use the individual properties and put them together to give you a tool that's really going to work very well for you. Um, and in case you haven't seen one, this is a really nice laminated plane blade. Can anyone tell me what's kind of weird about this plane blade, though? It's not a Japanese plane blade. 
I actually have the blade here. Um, this is a, which one? It's an Ashen Company um, plane blade. I, I found this in a wooden jointer plane that I picked up um, at, a, at an auction, not knowing that it was going to have a laminated plane. But you can see the lamination line is actually really nice. It's very even. It turns up nicely at the, at the ends. I'll pass this around. It's pretty sharp, so just be careful so you can take a look at it. But this lamination process is actually present in Western tool making when you go back to period furniture times. Um, you can find, if you look at it in flea markets, you can find old Western chisels that have laminations um, in them as well. Like I said, here's an example that I hap uh, hap happen to have. And um, I have to think that um, the Western uh, tool makers were pretty smart, uh, and blacksmiths were pretty smart as well, and they figure out the same sort of technology to use in their, uh, in their tools. So the question is, why did we get away from this? Because if you buy a, t a chisel or a plane blade these days uh, from, uh, from a Western uh, hand tool supplier, it's a single piece of steel. And you can actually tell when this happens. It happens somewhere in uh, around 1870 or so. And the reason the 1870 is important is because that's when the Industrial Revolution kicked in. And so if you want to make a tool in a factory, in a, a process, in, a, in a process that's somewhat automated, are you going to be able to laminate this stuff? Not really. You can't, uh, you can't automate a blacksmith. I, I mean, you know, maybe today you could probably build a robot to do that. Uh, but back in the 1870s, they weren't going to be able to, to do that, and that sort of thing. And so what they did was they started figuring out an alloy that sort of was in the middle of the hard steel and the soft, uh, soft steel. Where, um, uh, because then if you have a steel with those properties, you can just pour it in, into a mold, let it cool. When it cools, it pops out, and you hire a bunch of people with uh, not a whole lot of skill, and all they have to do is shape the, the thing and, and, and put the bevel on it and then put it in a box so that you can sell it to, uh, to someone. Um, so the thing is, when I think about this lamination thing, I really don't think, see it as a Japanese versus Western thing. I see it as a pre-industrial revolution versus post-industrial revolution thing. It just so happens that Japan as a country has decided that it's important enough to maintain traditional methods of work that they made it a priority, and that's one reason why I think it's been able to survive today. Um, there isn't a single Western um, tool maker that I know of that makes um, tools in this method. There's one guy named Matt Barr who used to make chisels using uh, that, that were laminated. I don't know if he's still in business uh, uh, these days, but that was, the only, uh, that was the only one. He certainly was not making this on a mass market um, uh, level. So, um, so Japanese tools, Western tools from this standpoint, really probably not as different as you might think. I mean, if there's a difference, it's a difference in terms of time and economy as opposed to East versus uh, West. And there's some other examples of this as well. Um, as as uh, many of you know, uh, Japanese chisels have a pretty defined, very lovely looking hollow on the backside of, the, of their ch uh, chisels and plane blades. And that's so that when you're flattening the back, it makes it easier because you only have to deal with the, peri the perimeter of the uh, back as opposed to the, um, uh, trying to flatten the entire back. Well, this is a uh, old uh, Western chisel. Again, I picked up at a, um, a, at a flea market. And you can tell, I mean, not so well in this picture over here, but there's actually a little bit of a hollow on the, on the backside here. And again, I'll pass this around so you all can take a look. And, and the, that, that hollow there, I don't think it's a rust spot or anything like that. that that's actually, when I talk to blacksmiths, um, there is a technique when you're making a chisel or a plane blade, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the old-fashioned way, of giving the center of the uh, tool, the back of the center of the tool, a couple extra wax. So you create a little bit of a depression there. Because you know, everybody knows that if you have a, um, a tool where the back is con convex and there's a hump in the middle, it's going to be impossible or really painful to get that tool into a useful uh, shape. But if you have a little bit of a depression, then it makes it uh, much, much easier. Now, Western toolmakers didn't um, take this to the same extent that Japanese toolmakers did, but the principle is still the same. So so you might think, well, you know, that's a nice old-fashioned concept, but, you know, who has time for that th these days in our modern world? Well, this is a, a page from the Ashley Isles um, uh, chisel catalog, a tool catalog. And Ashley Isles is a tool maker in England, and they do things pretty much in the, uh, in the traditional way. And one of their methods of making chisels and plane blades is the, uh, they, they initially process the steel for, um, to see uh, to, uh, to uh, heat treat it and whatnot. And they know coming out of that process 
one side is going to be somewhat convex and so the other side is going to be somewhat concave. And guess what? The concave side becomes the back of the tool. So this is a tool maker in the Western tradition that's operating today that's paying attention to this sort of thing. And you might say, well, okay, well, that's some sort of little boutique specialty tool maker in England. Who cares about them? Well, this is a chisel um, made by DeWalt, whatever DeWalt means these days, that was bought at Home Depot. Um, and if you take a look at the back of the chisel, I mean, this is a crappy chisel. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, um, you know, uh, hide that. But when, you, when I first started flattening the back of this chisel, you can see that there's a nice little perimeter here, where, and there's a little hole in the depression. And this is like a crappy chisel that you pick up at the big box uh, store, and it looks like the tool makers are still uh, do, doing this. And, and I thought at first I got lucky, but every chisel in the set turned out the same way. So, so uh, basic physics um, does work. So Japanese saws, um, you know, people think that uh, these are, um, a lot of people ha have the impression these are like these weird tools, they cut the wrong way, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is, as far as I can tell, the largest volume Japanese saw dealer uh, in the world. <laughs> Because you can go walk in the Home Depot and you can find these uh, shark saws. Um, they have various names, but they're all basically Japanese saws. So people um, have familiar, uh, some familiarity with them. Now, they're not as refined as the saws that a lot of us use and like, and like to use in our shops, but the principles that they work uh, on are the same. And this is um, you know, what I point out to people who are just getting into woodworking and thinking that Japanese tools are weird. It's like, you can just walk over to Home Depot and pick up one if you want to give it a try. Uh, but then they, people start asking, well, what about the geometry? Isn't it all wacky and, and, and hard to figure out and hard to sharpen? Um, not really. Um, I forgot to take a picture of uh, this, so I apologize. But th this is a model that I made of the rip, of rip teeth. This is a Western saw. This is a Japanese saw. So the way this saw would cut is that if the teeth would be in this position as it's moving across the wood, and the teeth act as little chisels, and that's how you make a rip cut. Japanese saw would work exactly the same way. The only difference is that the, the rake angle is more aggressive across the board. Um, and, uh, and there are many reasons for that, which I'm not going get, to uh, get into. But the principle is basically the same. So Japanese rip saws and Western rip saws are pretty much the same. But what about the cross-cut saws? And I have these models up here, but I did remember to take pictures of this, so they, uh, hopefully they project better. But this is a model that I made of a Western cross-cut saw. So these are all little equilateral triangles. Everything is 60 degrees, and there's facets on them uh, facing one way, and then the uh, one way, and then the other way. So what does this have in common with the Japanese saw? Well, this is kind of how I think about it. The first thing you do is you take this Western um, uh, cross-cut saw, and you just make the teeth taller. Okay, so I haven't changed anything. I've just made the teeth taller. That's this one here. Okay. Then you take the teeth and you lean them in one direction. So that's this one over here. And then, finally, you take a little file and you make a little knife edge at the very tip. So that's a Japanese crosscut saw. And if you think about uh, the crosscut teeth geometry this way, it's actually not that far off from a Western uh, uh, cr crosscut saw. Because other, uh, outside of the little knife tip, they're going to work uh, pretty much exactly the same way. <clears throat> planes. Um, there are a lot of planes floating around here that are set up way better than I can set them up. Uh, but one thing that they all have in common is that they're set up to take a very, very fine shaving. And uh, anybody that's even tried to use planes for, for any amount of time knows that you can't spend your entire day taking super fine shavings because you got other stuff uh, to do. So um, I do have a Japanese plane that I set up as a jack plane. And its main purpose is to hog off wood as quickly as possible. So how did I do that? Well, first thing I did was I went to eBay, and I found a plane that was narrower than your standard 70 millimeter wide uh, Japanese plane. Um, because I figured if I'm hogging off wood, I don't want to have to deal with a wide blade as, as well. So this one was 65 millimeters wide. But the key thing about this plane, plane is that it was super cheap. <laughs> That's really what I was looking for. So when I got it, I cleaned off the rust, and the blade turned out to be pretty nice. But this this is what I did uh, to this plane. I opened up the mouth, 
and I put a pretty aggressive camber on the, uh, on the blade. And when I use it, I set the depth of cut a lot thicker than I would for a shaving plane. Anybody that's used a Stanley Number no. 5 knows that that's how you set up a Stanley Number no. 5. It's exactly the same principles. So again, even though this is a Japanese plane, if you look, take a look at a Western plane, it's set up to do the same th sort of thing. There are a lot of things that they have in common um, in terms of their setup. But most of us want to use planes to uh, leave a nice, smooth surface, and so we don't have to deal with sanding. But the bugaboo of planing is tear out. So how do you uh, reduce tear out? Well, basically, um, you do the first two things first. You resharpen your blade. I don't care how sharp you think your blade is. You just resharpen it. And then you set your plane to take a thinner shaving, because those two things will actually solve a lot of problems uh, for you. And then after that, you can do two out of the last three things. You can either increase the bed angle, most Japanese planes have a bed angle of around 38, 40 degrees or so. But guess what? You can completely set up a Japanese plane to have a higher bed, uh, bed angle. Um, some people will just get a plane with a higher bed angle. Other people will make uh, two die for a single blade uh, with the bed, where the bed angle is changed. But you know, I found that when um, I, I do this, the results are pretty much the same as when you take a Western plane with a higher uh, bed angle. Um, tear out gets reduced. It's harder to pull. Uh, it's it's, it's hard, harder to uh, push the plane through the wood because the higher angle creates more resistance. But otherwise, again, everything is the same. You can tighten the mouth. Um, and if you walk around and take a look at you know, people's planes here, um, the planes that people use for these uh, planing contests, the mouth is going to be pretty tight. And if you have a plane that, uh, where the mouth is too wide open, you can certainly put a patch in there and tighten it up again. Well, in the Western wooden plane tradition, and, um, you can find plenty of examples of Western wooden planes where the mouth has been tightened up by a patch. And there are certainly a number of ways that you can take a Western you know, iron, uh, iron plane and tighten up the mouth. In the case of your typical Stanley, you can just move the frog forward uh, to do that. Um, if you have a low angle plane, oftentimes there's a little adjuster in the front end where you can do that as well. So again, the principles are the same. And then finally, you can use a chip breaker. And without getting into all the details of how to, uh, how to use a chip breaker, basically, again, the principles are the same. You want the chip breaker as close to the cutting edge as possible because that's when it's really going to work its best. And that's true for Japanese planes. It's true for Western planes. So again, all the physics and, um, uh, and the engineering aspects of the planes seem to be pretty similar. So here's the, um, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I found out. This is like a real Da Vinci moment, uh, a D Da Vinci code moment. Um, this guy over here is my good friend Bob Rosiaski. Um, he is a fantastic woodworker. He also does a lot of teaching and has made videos. He's got a YouTube channel and a uh, podcast and whatnot. And he's completely into using hand tools, but Western hand tools. Um, that's me on the other side, a much younger and skinnier version of me. Um, and, and, that, uh, and we're holding our respective uh, planes. Well, um, one of the uh, things that um, is a bit different about a Western plane compared to a Japanese plane is how you use it as you're making the actual uh, planing pass. And this is a photo that uh, we uh, put together to, sh uh, to show the difference. So this is Bob using his Western plane. And generally, you hold a Western plane like so. And as you put the plane on the wood, you, you're pushing down on the front end of the plane. And you push the thing forward. Um, and then as you get into the um, cut, you transition so that you're pushing down on the rear part of the plane. And the blade is set up so that the blade is closer to the front than it is to the back. And so all of your reference surface is on the back side as you're making the majority of the cut. And that's why we put the little um, piece of paper underneath to show that you could actually pass the paper underneath the plane so, so that there's uh, clear clearance there. Well. One, uh, one of the first times we got together, I brought my planes over to his shop, and he has a wide variety of Western wooden uh, uh, planes. Um, if you're using a Japanese plane, however, to flatten a board, the reference surface, you can set up a Japanese plane so that there are actually three touch points, one here, one here, and one in the back. So the entire body of the Japanese plane, if you're using it to flatten a board, is the reference surface. Okay. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So the idea is that um, if, you, uh, if, if you want to flatten a board, the longer your reference surface is, the flatter you can make the board. And that's why we have jack planes that are shorter than jointer planes, um, because you, uh, it's good to take a couple steps into this. Well, we, uh, uh, well, we were taking a look at, I was taking a look at Bob's uh, jack plane and jointer plane. And I was looking at uh, my planes. I had a standard length Japanese plane, and I had a Nagadai Kana, the, the, the long, longer one. And we found out this. So 
This is my regular plane, Japanese plane. This is the longer Nagadai uh, Kana plane. This is Bob's jack plane. This is his jointer plane. Again, the reference surface of a Western plane is going to be from the blade to the back. And the West reference surface for a Japanese plane, if you set it up with a three-point contact, is going to be the entire length. So my jack plane is exactly the same reference <laughs> length as, the, as uh, Bob's uh, uh, Western jack plane. And my Japanese jointer plane has exactly the same re uh, reference length as the uh, uh, Western uh, jointer plane. And, and, and I can't believe that there's this much of a coincidence between, uh, between the two. Um, we didn't plan this for sure. It's not like he picked out certain planes and I picked out uh, certain planes. There's nothing special about the planes that we use. So the question is obviously, why is it this way? And if you go back again to my assumption that you know, Japanese woodworkers had the same uh, priorities and goals as Western woodworkers, and they needed tools to develop, um, uh, uh, to develop tools to accomplish their tasks. Well, maybe for human-sized people making boards that are, you know, for human-sized projects, to initially flatten it, you need about this much reference surface, and to really get it straight, you need about that much ref reference surface. So, okay, one, one final bit on um, similarities, uh, sharpening. Um, you can um, get way deep into uh, sharpening uh, with the Japanese stones. You can talk to Jay or Jude or anybody else here about that, because they know a lot more about this than me. Um, many Western woodworkers will use oil stones for sharpening as opposed to water stones and um, finish off with a honing compound and a strop. And I've often heard this sort of conversation when, we, um, when people talk about sharpening. It's like somebody will say, well, I don't want to use water stones because you know, they go up to 8,000 or 16,000 grit, and that's just like going too far. But you know, instead, I use this honing compound. Um, and everybody agrees that the honing compound is a very you know, uh, uh, typical and well thought out way to finish off your, your, your sharpening reg uh, regimen. Well, if you take a look at how sharpening um, media works, basically they're abrasive particles that you're using to sand away um, the, the steel. Um, and it's just like sanding, um, it's just like sanding wood. Um, I know I shouldn't talk about sanding wood in this <laughs> environment, but uh, in, in, when you sand wood, you start with your coarse grits and you work your way up to the final grit and then you're done, right? Well, with sharpening is the same principle. You start off with some abrasive material that's more suited to steel than it is to wood, and you start with relatively coarse grits, and then you move up to uh, finer grits as you go on. And one good way of figuring out the differences or, 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 or comparing different sharpening media is to just look at the size of the abrasive particles. Well, guess what? If you actually take a look at that, the abrasive particles in an 8,000, 16,000 grit uh, man-made Japanese water stone or a natural Japanese water stone is a little bit less than run one micron in diameter, which is exactly the same size as honing compound. So, when, you know, so to me, it makes no sense to say, oh, going to up to a 16,000 grit water stone is going too far, but using honing compound is a well thought out and measured way of uh, finishing up your sharpening. It's actually pretty much the same um, uh, abrasive compounds when you break it down to that, uh, to that level. All right. So I'm going to, uh, I wanted to go back to um, this box that I made. Like I said, this is probably the nicest thing that I made. And, and this project is completely in the Western woodworking tradition. Um, I think I mentioned it's a Bible box. It's a, piece of, um, it, it, it's a piece of woodworking that many people in the Pennsylvania area would have had in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. It has a lock on it. Um, and it was called a Bible box because you could stick your Bible in it. And because of the lock, people who often would um, put their valuables in it, which didn't make any sense sense because you could just, if you're a thief, you can just pick up the box and walk off with it and saw it open. But that's what it was. Um, and like I said, it's, it's a completely traditional woodworking project. I made this thing completely with Japanese tools. Um, and the only, comp uh, and, and the only um, allowance I had to uh, make involved the uh, edge detail here on the lid and down at the bottom. Because the original detail had um, an oval shape. So it's basically a curve that's sort of flat and then it drops off. Like and I didn't have a Japanese tool that could do that. But the reason I didn't have a Japanese tool that could do that is because that sort of form actually didn't exist as a, an aesthetic element in Asia er, er, anywhere. So that's why they didn't make. Uh, that's the, why they didn't make that tool. Um, instead, this you know, the edge treatment that I use is actually pretty typical, and I had a plane that would do that and just you know around all the sides, and I was done. So that so that was awesome. And then I did it on the underside because I was having so much fun, and I thought it looked better. Um, 
But uh, to me, this is probably the, um, uh, the, the take-home message that I like to deliver, that tool, tools at some level are just tools. And certainly, they're wonderful things that people can do and do with them. But I think if we think more about how our tools are more alike than they are different, um, we'll be able to uh, talk to other people about Japanese tools in a way that's probably going to be more, uh, more effective. Because I know that the goal here is to um, spread the word about why Japanese tools are so wonderful to use in their shop and, 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 and whatnot. And uh, this is the way that I found uh, this to be, um, uh, uh, this is the way that I found that is most effective uh, for me. Um, so. Thanks for coming. If you want more information, I, like I said I do have a website. It's called Giant Cypress. I've been writing that for about nine years um, now. Um, last year, right about this time, um, I made a DVD for a popular woodworking magazine. I brought a few. They're not for sale. Uh, but if you want one, give a $25 donation to Kazuro Kai, and you can have it. Um, so the money is just going to uh, uh, go, go to the organization uh, here. Um, I, I've written some articles in pop, uh, Popular Woodworking. If you go to my website, you can see, uh, uh, see that. But, um, but uh, yeah, thanks, for, thanks for coming. I'm happy to take any questions. I have a bunch of um, old Western planes. Yeah. And, um, I find I have a real hard time flattening the backs on them. I the, don't know. the back, the backs the of backs, the, the plane yeah. blade itself. Yeah. Do you, Do you come across that? Because I, I I was surprised how nice that laminated. I have a few that are laminated yeah. also, but the backs are not. They, they, they're I, they're rounded. Yeah. 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 So what I would do is actually. Um, Come up with whatever you can think of. You can like wrap a piece of coarse sandpaper around something that's round, or use a Dremel tool and just make your own hollow on the backside, and just use that to get rid of the middle. And then, and then you can go back to uh, you know flattening it out. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, what's the significance of the colors on the labeling? Of the oh, the colors. colors. Yeah, yeah. So basically. Um, all of those tool steels come from Hitachi. Um, Hitachi makes more than green cordless tools. They, they, um, they, they make a tool steel on an industrial level. The blue steel is called blue steel because it comes wrapped in blue paper. The white steel is called white steel because it comes wrapped in white paper. That's, that's basically it. Yeah. There's, there's not, not much more. <laughs> than the, than Any that. other questions for Wilbur? Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thanks. Thank you, Wilbur.